Hello, and welcome to Livre Canada Books Export Market Webinar, Exporting to Latvia. I'm Christy Doucette, Programs Manager, and I'll be here to facilitate the webinar. The presentation should take about 60 minutes, and we've set aside time at the end for your questions. We'll be taking questions via the Q&A function in WebEx found at the right-hand part of your screen. Feel free to submit questions throughout the webinar, and we'll collect them at for the Q&A session at the end. You will also receive a copy of the presentation following the event. If you encounter any problems or have any questions relating to WebEx, please message me as the host via the chat function in WebEx. I'm now pleased to introduce our presenter, Vilis Kassims, who is a writer, translator, and since 2011, a representative of the Latvian literature abroad. In this work, his main focus has been on the English-speaking market, particularly the UK. Together with his colleagues, he's managed the selling of rights to more than 30 Latvian prose, poetry, children's, and nonfiction titles to publishers in the UK, US, and Canada, along with numerous rights sold in other language markets. Welcome, Vilis, and thanks for joining us. I'll now Thank turn you. over the mic to you. Hello, Christian, and thank you for the introduction. Uh, first off, I will mention that I do have a bit of a sore throat, so I apologize in advance for coughing or uh, tea sipping or whatever else might turn. Uh, so, yeah, to begin with, uh, as uh, a lot of you probably or maybe don't know where Latvia is, here's the map. It's in the northeastern part of Europe, which means that we have a lot of uh, very unpleasant, cold, dark weather, which might not be new to you, but uh, still, it probably has colored our register as well. Uh, and yeah, it has land borders with Russia, with Belarus, uh, with Lithuania and Estonia, and we have access to the Baltic Sea, which has allowed for a lot of intermixing of culture with Scandinavia, Poland, and Germany. And still, Latvia is one of the more sparsely populated countries in Europe, a lot of forests and pastures. However, it's more densely populated than any Canadian province that I've seen. To compare, it's a bit bigger than Nova Scotia, but there are about twice as many people living in Latvia than in Nova Scotia. Uh, so yeah, it's about 2 million people in Latvia, and what's worth noting is that we are a bilingual nation de facto, but officially, it's a monolingual country. Latvian is the only official language, even though about 80% of the people speak both Latvian and Russian, at least at a national level. Uh, this is due to the era of Soviet occupation, which lasted for 50 years, when uh, Russian was made the other official language, and there were a lot of people who came in from different parts of the Soviet Union, and uh, since then, there was there's a backlash of this attempt to create a Soviet nation. Uh, and the two societies still are quite separate in Latvia, generally consuming media, including books, in their own language. Uh, as you can see, the surveys are quite low in Latvia. However, the living expenses are lower as well than the majority of Western countries. For instance, the average monthly rent is around 200 euros. So it does leave some money for books as well. Not that a lot as we'll see, but still. Uh, elderly people have it harder, especially because they have extra expenses and the pensions are quite low and generally fixed. It's also worth noting that the city of Riga, our capital, counts for almost half of the total population of the country. So it's all very, very centralized. And pretty much everything that happens that day happens in Riga. Uh, I won't go in depth of the history of the country. Uh, there are some basic information here. What is worth noting, though, is that there's, uh, the history of the last millennium or so has sort of crystallized in this narrative of 700 years of slavery uh, that we've suffered through the hands of, of different other nations. It's not strictly true, but it has shaped our self-consciousness, our culture, our interests. And uh, also, because
because of that, for the vast majority of this past millennium, there were barely any schools in Latium, basically until the Serbs were freed in the 19th century. And all the publishing that took place there was done by German publishers. However, after the independence was in 1918, uh, the literacy rates were very high, and the publishing of books in Latium became widespread. For instance, in 1936, just before World War II, uh, there were 1,600 books published in Latvia with every extension of 2,500 copies per title, which is considerably more than uh, is being published now, actually. Uh, however, with the coming of the Soviet era, most of these publishing houses were shut down. There were state-run publishing houses, and all the Publishing was heavily controlled, financed, censored, and planned by the Soviet government. In this time, there were also a lot of people who left Latvia, fleeing to the West mostly, to Scandinavia, to the UK, to the US, and also to Canada. Around 30,000 people came to Canada during the World War II and afterwards. Uh, most people were centered in Toronto. Uh, for instance, our former president, Larry Söderberg, I uh, used to live in Toronto for decades, I think 20 years, and then she moved to teach in university in Montreal. So there's this history that we have, and there's still considerable interest in the life stories of Latvians living in exile, including in Canada. Uh, now I'll give you a broad overview of, of reading habits in Latvia, which this part is more statistics and data focused. However, it's also a shorter part, but it will give you an idea of what and how much the people actually read in Latvia and what are they looking for. Uh, so as you can see from the figures here, the, there's not that much uh, interest in reading uh, compared to other Western countries. I think in Germany, the amount of people who read a book a year was close to 80%. Uh, and let's say this number, the 55%, has dropped considerably in the last decade due to other competing media that become more popular and also mobile devices with, uh, with internet being around everywhere. It sort of has diminished this interest in reading. However, well, six and a half books a year read on average, I think, is not bad, uh, all things considered. As everywhere, women are bigger readers than men. And it's also interesting that Russians read more than Latvians. My guess would be that it's due to the wider range of books available in shops, because they have all the books published in Russian available for them. It's obviously if you have something, a particular interest in particular topic, or you're interested in this genre or that genre, you want to read more, and there's much more choice there than that. Uh, you can see that people don't spend a lot of money on books, seven and a half euros, uh, even last year, is less than average price per book. Uh, so probably most readers buy one book a year, which is less than they spend on magazines, on theater, on music, sports, whatever. And uh, it's probably the biggest problem, I think, for the publishers in last year, because... Uh, it seems that even readers aren't buying that many books, and non-readers aren't very interested in buying books to read. Still, there's some prestige, some sort of fate associated with reading, so it's not really going anywhere, I don't think. Also worth noting is uh, that uh, there's a higher and higher interest in reading local. Even so, these figures show that contemporary foreign literature, foreign prose, is uh, the more popular topic. This was done a few years ago, and since then, this has changed a bit. And also, you can more or less group Latvian and Russian literature together because responders were both Latvians and Russians within Latvia. So generally, people try, uh, tend to stick more to their literature. Uh, which also shows in the best-selling book list that I will, I will show you later. And yeah, the interest in foreign literature that is there, 
tend to be centered more around nearby countries like Russia, Lithuania, Estonia, mostly. Uh, even so, the print run of translation from these countries, from Russia and Lithuania and Estonia, aren't a lot above average. So, one thing is what people say, and something else is what they actually read. Uh, and translations from English, Spanish, and Italian are ones that are printed more than average in that year. And anyway, most people in this poll said that they don't really care or know about the country of origin for the translation, which makes some sense because translations from the US and the UK are always among the best selling translated fiction and non-fiction. So it's, it's always there. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of people who read both Latin and Russian. It might not be very encouraging data because uh, it shows that our already small market split between two languages and the majority of people don't even buy the books they read. Uh, but uh, as we will see later, things are changing a bit and uh, there is expectation for that and there are still opportunities. So yeah. <coughs> Um, now I'll talk more about publishers moving from people to the industry, uh, to the books they do, to show you what is the state of publishing Latvia, who are the more important publishers, what do they publish, and in what quantity. Hopefully this will give you an idea of, of the types of books the Latin publishers are looking for when they're looking to buy rights from some other country. Some more discussion data here, I guess, but uh, again, this, like I said previously, the, these statistics can be a bit misleading because there's, yes, the print run is going down from average, averaging 1700, uh, 1700 uh, per title to 1200. However, this also includes booklets, this includes self published vanity press stuff which is becoming more and more accessible and more and more popular. And the main publishers in Latvia are all saying that their numbers haven't really dropped in the last five years. However, uh, it hasn't also really recovered after the financial crisis. For instance, when in compared to 2001, the total print run of all the books in Latvia has decreased by more than a half. However, it's not all the higher. Uh, the, the average print run of translations in particular has suffered a lot less. They still have decreased, but uh, it's more due to the fact that there are less books being bought and published. So, translations from the less popular languages, which is, say, not English, not Russian, not French, not German, have actually been printed more on average. So there's, there is still interest in literature and books from other countries that more or less has stayed the same, going up a bit, going down a bit, but it's still that. When talking about bestsellers in Latvia, 3,000 copies is what for, for most publishers counts as a very good uh, book, not necessarily a top of the charts kind of thing, but a very good book that they're very satisfied with the amount. And there's usually five to ten titles that sell more than 5,000 copies a year. The very best selling books sell 20, 30,000 copies over a few years. And uh, yeah, as I said before, it's all dominated by Riga by the capital. 87% of the top of print run is published in Riga. So almost everything that's being published last year is published in Riga. Now, talking about the book market uh, in Latvia, this is uh, more or less a list of the common complaints that Latin publishers have about Latin book market. Uh, there's no fixed price for books, so er every shop sets their own prices, which means that, uh, well, it means that's control for the publisher, and uh, because the bookshop market is heavily dominated by two chains, that both belong to a publisher, they really have the 
possibility to dictate the market, which other publishers don't really like, obviously. Uh, the biggest publisher in the country is also also owns uh, probably the biggest chain in the country, it's Weizmann. And uh, they focus a lot on regions on the countryside, and in a lot of smaller towns, theirs is the only bookshop. Which would be alright, if not for the fact that they tend to carry more their own books, obviously, leaving very little space for books by other publishers. Uh, which, again, you can imagine that not a lot of publishers are very happy that their titles are practically impossible to buy outside of uh, outside of Riga and some other bigger towns. However, there's been attempts to fight against monopoly, but hasn't really worked out. The other chain, the Anschluss, is actually more like a proper bookshop chain with a smallish publisher attached. Uh, and because of that, they carry a wider range of books. And it's not so much of a walled garden where only their stuff can go. The other bookshops that we have mostly boutiques or having a, or they have a traditional location, they've been there in that place in Malaysia mostly for decades and they're not going to move from that. Uh, as far as online book uh, market goes, I'll talk about a minute later, but the general gist is that the position is much weaker than in most countries in the West. People tend to, if they buy books, as we saw previously, they probably will buy it in a shop rather than ordering it online. And uh, as you can see, the price of books is quite, well, compared to other countries in Europe, it's quite low. Uh, to give you an idea of the range, new hardcover fiction titles that have just come out cost around 15 euros in shop. And children's books will be more closer to 7, 6 euros. However, books that have come out like three or more years ago, if there's still a decent amount of unpop copies, you can usually find them in bargain bins for 1 euro, 2 euro, 3 euros. And uh, this is another thing that like, the publishers don't like because they see it as devaluing the worth of the book. Now, this uh, this diagram shows that even though there are more books published in Axiom, however, the print runs, this is the total print run on the right, the print runs are higher for books in other languages, which again can be explained with uh, the fact that there, there's a lot of self publishing going on, there's uh, a found book lab like little informative books about so this town or that town, which obviously is printed in 200 copies, so it brings the average and total print run down a bit. Uh, and the, among the other languages, mostly English, obviously, which uh, the breakdown will be in the next slide. And uh, what's interesting here, which you don't see from this simple chart, is that the Latin original fiction and non-fiction titles are dominated by quite a few very well-selling books. But the Middle East, uh, we just don't have that many authors uh, to build up a decent Middle East to, to satiate the hunger that people who read have for, for these books. So we rely on sensations a lot for, the, for this Middle East, for the books that sell decent amounts. They might not become bestsellers, but they still a decent amount, they make a profit, and they're let it happen. Um, as I mentioned before, Russian is the other language in Latvia. However, there's practically no publishing happening in, in Russian in Latvia, uh, because all the books published in Russian come from Russia. There's one or two small exceptions, but by and large, it's uh, all the publishers in Latvia Published books almost exclusively in Latvian, so you don't have to worry about things like Russian like for Russian language uh, when you sell books to Russian publishers. They will only be interested in Latvian, right? Only in Latvia, which which makes it uh, I guess simpler compared to some other countries. This uh, chart, so the outer ring is the total print run proportionally, and the inner ring is the amount of books published. As you can see, the English 
language dominates the space mark heavily, covering almost two thirds of the total screen time of translated titles. Uh, and the average screen time is also quite high compared to, to other languages. French is uh, still one of the more popular languages in Europe, especially for people to learn and to, to speak, to study, because, for instance, one of the more high class, the more highly valued tools in Latvia is a French international school. And uh, because of that, we have a lot of good translators working from the French language. However, there's, there doesn't seem to be that much interest, especially for translating from French, for French typing. And uh, for instance, the average print run for books translated from French is 1,100 copies, whereas for English, the number is 1,700 copies, which I guess it shows that uh, there is maybe more books translated from French than that actually readers interested in them. Uh, probably because of this interest in French language and culture that we have, which means, luckily enough, that French titles do have a chance to be sold to Latvia, even if they're not as best of us, because the people who publish the things from French, they tend to be also interested in the French culture. Uh, the, the others, the languages that are here, are mostly other European languages with uh, very, very few translations coming from Asian or African languages. And uh, it's also interesting that there's very few translations in Spanish, despite the fact that it's this huge market. However, we haven't had that many translators working from Spanish, which, which probably uh, explains that. And also, we haven't really had any cultural ties. So if something is a bestseller in Latin America and the speaking world, we probably won't, won't know about it. Now, this is uh, using Latvian terminology a bit, uh, but uh, when you compare the print runs of different sections of different types of books, which methods or genre, uh, you will see that obviously school textbooks have the highest print runs, uh, which is 3,500 copies on average. But, but due to the fact that there's often little choice for the students and for the teachers, because there are very high requirements as to what can be uh, published uh, as a textbook. So there tends to be less of them published than, for instance, in the UK. And uh, if you look in the, over the last 15 years, children's literature is actually the only uh, sector that has increased total print run. And you can see here on the chart as well that if there's more children's books published than anything else. And, the, and so the average print run has decreased over the last 15 years, but it's mostly a fact the increasing variety and amount of choice that the market has compared to 15 years ago, when we simply had, we had less writers, we had less translators, we had less publishers. So there were just less titles available, so they printed more copies. I will go m more in depth uh, into the book market later because it's definitely one of the thriving sectors in publishing at the moment, also in translation. But uh, it's worth noting that uh, other average print runs of other sectors have also decreased, and really it's only children that have stayed more or less the same. Fiction, uh, popular science, reference books, more or less everything has gone down. Again. <clears throat> now, uh, with the publishers, this list might give you an idea that uh, they are more or less on similar footing, more or less similar size. However, when you talk about publishers in Latvia, it's uh, basically the and the rest. Uh, I will give you a brief overview of a few of the main ones that if you want to know about any of them more detail and more details or whatever, or if you're interested in different publishers that covering a particular niche, feel free to email me later or ask in Q and A questions here, and I will do my best to help you. So 
Zweisner started as textbook publisher, continuing from the Soviet era publishing house with the same name. And in the 90s, they were the only ones still ever who were allowed to publish school textbooks. Obviously, it was a very lucrative field, and they made a very good use of it. And it's also worth noting that they received these numbers without acquisitions or mergers. They simply expanded, expanded, expanded. So they do publish a lot and a lot of everything. Uh, strangely enough, however, they only had three titles among the top 20 best-selling books in 2017, uh, which can be explained with the fact that they haven't really focused that much on Latvian literature, Latvian books, until quite recently, and they also have missed out on some big names uh, internationally. So the stronghold is midlist, the books that sell, 2,000 copies uh, that uh, bring them money, that keep them, let them keep going, that might not stop the charts, but doesn't really matter. So they do fiction, they do children, they do popular science, self-help, almost anything that may be academic. If you have a title that has sold well uh, in Canada or preferably other countries as well and has an interesting hook, then you're willing to give it a go. And yeah, the publishing is quite compartmentalized, which means that for instance, the popular science books, uh, the person who deals with them won't deal with anything else, whereas in other uh, publishers, it tends to be a couple of people dealing with more or less everything. One of the bigger other publishers is Lotus Medi, which used to be called Lotus, but they changed their name, uh, I think, last year. They publish not only books, but also magazines, among the biggest daily newspapers in Latvia. But the book side of the business is also doing well. You can see they have high print runs, uh, more than, possibly more than average. Uh, they do focus a lot on original Latvian literature, mostly commercial, uh, family saga, history, historical novels, romance, with the patient mostly rounding up the press. Uh, because there's just not that much children, young adults, crime or romance books published in Latvia and by Latin authors. So they have to buy rights for those. Still, because they tend to be more popular in the more security countryside publisher, uh, the titles, both crime and romance and uh, children's, would have to be appealing for broad readership without any risky uh, content. So without erotica for romance, without sort of gore for crime, and without possibly questionable topics for, for some of the younger adults. Now, Egmont uh, is the only publisher in Latvia that, ha that is a part of the international uh, publishing group. Because of that, they don't really participate that much in the publishing community, and they just have their titles mostly that they, that they work with. It's not only Egmont's group titles, but it's back in terms of them on there. And they exclusively do children and young adults. They're best known for comics like Simpsons and then all dark comics, among others. And they have the Barbie book, so they have Frozen. You mentioned they have it. Yarn Rules is the <coughs> is the other publisher with uh, bookshop um, side of the business that's very important. And the publisher herself, she is the head of Latin Publishers Association. And this is one publishing house which has the publisher's personal choices and taste is shaping the press a lot more than other bigger publishers. But at the same time, they've been soon enough to acquire some international investors like Polo Coelho, which has allowed them to do some very literary fiction like Matthias Senar uh, or Sergei Jordan. And art books as well, which tend to be the things that the publisher is interested in. So with Ovian Rose Fabgat, it's also interesting that they work a lot with translators. Uh, and generally, the things they publish, they start as a translation, translator's recommendation, which, uh, which can be problematic for publishers in Canada or abroad because they don't necessarily have the opportunity to reach 
and publish and they translate that. However, if you have something that so you can fit their profile, if you write to them or if you speak to them in one of the book fairs, they will more likely give it to a translator to read and they will listen to their opinion. And then um, here we have two other publishers that can be called medium sized for last year. And uh, these are two of the more commercial publishers. First, the Continent. They've done and are still doing Dan Brown, C.R. James, Michael Connolly, etc. It's mostly crime, thrillers, and romance. They tend to very, very fall outside of these genres. And they have quite big big fans, as you can see. And uh, they don't do almost any Latin offers at all. Although that might change because they recently, I think last year, picked up local erotica offer, which is selling very, very well for them. Still, I say that uh, romance and thrillers are the thing that you could have more chance to succeed with this continent. But because they are heavily commercially oriented, there would need to be proven titles, especially abroad. I mean, uh, you have to talk about sales data, you have to talk about figures, and you have to make a certain case for that. Finally, there's Yumova, which was one of the first publishing houses established in Latvia after real game independence in 1990. But uh, recently, they've been going through some rougher times. And you can see that they have ridiculously low average print runs but that can be explained by the fact that they, especially lately, they do a lot of sponsored books. For instance, recently they did the children's book with stories about potatoes. And it was, the expenses were covered by a potato starch manufacturer. Obviously, that hasn't become a bestseller, and it probably was printed in 100 or 200 copies, but still it was possible for them, so that, this is how they work. And uh, I wouldn't say that they have particular niche or particular interest in any topic. They see what's popular and then they look what could work for them. So if you have a title that um, that is trendy, that might not be bestseller in that particular niche, in that particular genre, it might be worth contacting them because if they say if they see that okay. Erotica is now selling. Let's see what erotic authors we can get that have proven, even if they're not so successful. Who knows? We want, they want to be the first ones to follow, rather than focus necessarily on the big, big names. <coughs> and the rest of the publishers, they are mostly focusing on particular niche. And uh, if you have questions about those, I will obviously let you know. Now, uh, we'll move away from numbers and data now to focus on, on bigger picture. Uh, I'll, I'll try to talk about what I've seen uh, people publishing, what I've, what I've heard people talk, what the data implies, what the publishers are saying, they're looking for, what's including more, this kind of stuff. I won't cover everything. So again, yeah, if there's anything special that I have skipped, do let me know. I'll start with fiction. Uh, and uh, so it gets uh, an idea of the fiction publishing scene in Latvia. This is prose, adult prose. As more or less anywhere in Europe or probably in the, in the world, almost all the translated fiction is from the United States and the United Kingdom. There is some Canadian, some Australian uh, books translated from English or French, but tend to be very little, not because we have anything in Canada or Australia, but uh, I think we just don't have much of an idea what's going on in Canada, apart from the, the big bestsellers, like Robert Margaret Hatwood is very popular in Latvia, Robin Sharma is, well, it's not fiction, really, but anyway. Uh, and because of that, for Canadian publishers, I would say it's mostly genre fiction that holds more respect, unless you're talking about an award-winning, nation successful literary novelist. Even that might be difficult to sell. For instance, 
Emma Donoghue or Miriam Sulis haven't been translated still. They, I think they hold a chance, but uh, it's, it won't be, uh, because literary fiction is not doing very well in general, it won't be something that publishers would really seek out themselves. Now, this is the top 20 best, or top 50 bestsellers from the Jan Sula, the bookshop from 2017, which is generally similar to the Charles Modern Nun Weissner bookshop. Of the Weissner bookshop, Charles Charles dominated by Weissner books. There are a couple of interesting things here. First, there's only one non Latin author in the top 10, which is a Russian book about spying. Because we have a lot of interest in Russia still. And uh, one more, the Fate Pack in Top 20, which is an, again another Russian book. And then uh, further down the list, you have a lot of, of the typical bestsellers, but the Top 20 is heavily dominated by books in Latvia, which is really quite extraordinary because it used to be dominated by translation. And uh, I think it's not that many countries in Europe have top 20 list that's almost entirely uh, original literature. So there's a feeling that the pendulum will swing back and readers will look more into patients again. So it's just a question of what will be that thing that will swing it back. <clears throat> now, to quickly go to some of the titles in top 10, the top 1 best selling book is actually poetry. Uh, it's, it's not anything highbrow. It's the uh, senior songwriter, uh, his book of 365 poems that he published on social media first. He did uh, the, the thing where every day of the year he published one little poem, and uh, they were popular, and then he collected them in a book. And yeah, that's, that's the phenomena. Basically, that's the mouth from another book that shot right up the chart as well. Uh, it's, I guess, something similar to Rupi Kaur in Canada or in, or in the West, uh, but with a lot of flavor. Uh, then the second book is actually an anonymous author. It's a crime book, uh, but it's basically talking about people that are very well known in Latvia, businessmen, politicians, and their possible involvement in... Uh, in shady dealing, so there's a lot of interest in that. Third book is the uh, local erotica author, the first real erotica book we've had in Latvia, and it became super popular. It is, the author is very young, so this this train will go on for a while, I think. The um, spying book is the fourth, then there's a historical novel, actually, of the title from the fifth. Then there are three historical novels from a series uh, that talks about that in the 20th century. It was uh, started by a writer and the person now picked up and found well established, very well regarded Latvian authors uh, to do uh, books about each about different parts in the 20th century history in Latvia, and they have really been very, very popular. That's it next year, number five, Duna number eight, and Istanbul number nine. And then uh, there's a book by a Lutheran pastor about relationships, which is uh, a bit, it can be seen as a bit weird, but uh, he's very, very popular in Latvia. He's uh, had a column in daily newspaper, he's always on TV, and now, or he's not pastor anymore because he resigned a month ago because partly with the book. There was a lot of controversy about that. And then there's uh, some more local things that I will talk about later. <coughs> uh, and also you can note uh, quite a few self-published books in top 20, which might indicate that the era of big publishers dictating the fashion in the has diminished. Now, uh, about fiction, uh, yeah, as I said, historical novels are especially popular if they have local flavor don't have to be Latvian uh, novels, but they can be circle of family sagas, they can be a uh, historical novel with some kind of Baltic element in them, and then it's much, much more likely to sell. 
It's uh, also worth noting that thrillers and science fiction fantasy, including horror, don't just sell all that much in Asia. And in general, the market tends to be author oriented. And the publishers would really prefer it if an author has proven to have staying power. So if they have been able to find a reader with more than just one or two books, uh, especially that's especially true for genres so such as have a romance or crime or thriller author that only has one book and will have smaller chance to be sold than if they have ten books and they're all been maybe not necessarily the best selling book of the year, but they've been uh, commercially successful titles. Now I will look a bit deeper into the genres. Um, romance books have always sold well in Latvia, partly possibly due to the fact that they were not allowed in Soviet era. So afterwards there was this wave of interest in them, and now there's a delayed wave of interest in erotica. Uh, but for pure romance titles, not, not much for sure. And uh, when I'm talking about exotic settings here, it can easily be rural Canada, uh, which is something I think a lot of Latin readers would be able to relate to and find interesting due to both similarities and differences. The city life uh, for romance books, well, now it's, it's getting more popular. It used to be mostly tend to a rural part, rural side of, of the genre, but now city romance is perfectly fine as well. Um, as for crime, it's much more diverse, I would say. It's still quite difficult to figure out what is the, the in thing. And there's this feeling that publishers are looking for the next big thing in crime. And they're trying different things. They're trying more gory things. They're trying a more uh, suspense-based things, more psychological crime. One thing that's almost, uh, almost totally absent in the black and book market are cozy mysteries, for instance. You know, Miss Marple series were very, very popular back in the day. And still, characters and atmosphere is very important for crime novels as well. As for literary fiction or general fiction, uh, yeah, the family sagas are very popular now. Um, if there's historical connection, not necessarily to Latvia, but Lithuania, for instance, with the Sepetis was big in Latvia as well, uh, then yeah, it's much, much more likely to sell if there's some kind of connection there. As for prose style, uh, it's uh, I would say that people in Latvia tend to like more ornamented prose than in the West. So this very direct Hemingway kind of prose is not necessarily uh, very popular in Latvia, at least not uh, at the moment, and hasn't really been popular for the last 10, 15, 20 years, so I don't see it changing very quickly. Now, uh, moving on to children's publishing, as I said before, along with romance and crime, children's publishing is one factor where there can definitely be increased presence of Canadian authors, especially among middle grade and young adult books, where there are less Latin authors writing that uh, type of, of, of literature. Uh, in Kidlet, we have a lot more popular and active authors, plus uh, there's this still a sustained interest in children's verse, which doesn't necessarily translate very well or very easily. Um, and yeah, now I will go more into detail in children's books and what sells and what's, uh, what's popular, what I'm trying. First, for picture books, uh, you can see some of the more popular children's books and their illustrations. Uh, this is by, uh, the one on the left is by Reynes Peterson. Then it's Maravish, and Elena Brasny, the old papers. And uh, one thing that everybody says is that we have fantastic illustrators. So if you're selling picture books, the illustrations have to be very, very good, or have something unique for them. However, as I said, picture books, we, are, we have quite well covered with lots of titles, partly because the importance of the of the covers and the illustrations. Now, with the middle grade and young adult, uh, it's worth noting that traditionally, students' literature in general in Latvia has focused more on wordplay and comedy, uh, which is still very noticeable when you look at the kind of books that get published, that get sold. 
and uh, neither age group tend to focus a lot on diversity or inclusiveness. And these simply aren't topics that, uh, that the parents tend to focus on, that they are interested in in general at the moment. And uh, yeah, the learning for young leaders is encouraged. So, so if there's some educational content, it's good, but uh, I think nowadays a lot of parents are simply happy if the kids read, and there's not really a stigma of reading books that are not educational. Uh, in the young adult market, uh, it wasn't very popular in Latin Soviet era, as it was more focused on teaching teenagers and right behavior, uh, but now there's, uh, this, is, this is the segment that is really growing, and uh, where this segment where more and more publishers are stepping in and they are looking for more and more titles. Fantasy is big for young adults, realistic young adults. Less so, still, some titles are very popular, like the Arthur series, which baffles me a bit because One Direction isn't really the head big in last year, or well, maybe uh, it is for some, uh, in some age groups, I don't know. But generally, the best sellers are the are the fantasy titles. Even things like you know, John Green or other very popular realistic young adult writers uh, that are very popular abroad aren't necessarily big in that they, they don't really succeed very well. But yeah, and for middle grade, uh, Destiny is a phenomenon. Uh, there are books done in similar styles of the of the um, Diary of the Wimpy Kid, and it shows no signs of slowing down. <clears throat> now, I'm talking about nonfiction. Uh, these these are the three um, topics, three segments that uh, enjoy the highest influence, more interest. And uh, because the country is still quite traditional, quite conservative, and uh, as you saw in the top ten list, locally produced how to be a womanly woman books are extremely popular, popular, which uh, is probably out of fashion in the West. Because of that, uh, also people tend to do stuff around the house themselves, and they prefer books that have practical approach to doing things. Uh, they are looking for for how to books in a way as well, especially when consider, when talking about uh, things like repairing your own uh, furniture or building your own things or gardening, these kind of things are still popular. As uh, for self-help, uh, because of the communist era, there's a lot of interest in motivational business books, which is something that we have, weren't really familiar with before and what in Sharma the author is probably the best example of what buyers are looking for, and she's extremely popular in Latvia. And there's less focus on living happily, possibly because of the low material, lower material quality of life. And yes, the charity books and towards is a terrorist path, but uh, it's a niche that I'm not very familiar with, so I can look into it if you're interested, and I can let you know. I know publishers are working with it, but they will be able to tell you more what they are looking for exactly. And then history and biography, as I said before, it is still the, the other big thing. As long as it's centered around Latvia, Baltic, or Soviet era, or contemporary Russia as well. If you have something like that, definitely worth offering. And for hobbies, yeah, we have gardening, knitting, and for sports, ice hockey, and basketball. There are two main things. Everything else, much less popular, however, than that many books published about ice hockey or basketball. And we have to have a general overview of ice hockey that's not very North America focused. That's another good possibility. And yeah, full books rarely translated, and you don't really see them on bestseller lists, unlike UK, for instance. The academic popular science, there's enough. There's, uh, they're so Mm, well centered on particular publishing house that they tend to do things their way, they tend to know what they want and they just go on with it. And if you suggest something to them, 
they might keep in, into mind, but they won't necessarily follow after that. Uh, now, I'll go through various topics to show you how the publishing industry works in Latvia, which I know is very different from Canada, but there are some different policies. So the first thing is that there are no agents or sub-agents, and publishers prefer, really, they prefer working directly. I don't know how many times I've heard uh, publishers saying that, yeah, this is interesting, but we don't want to really go through an agent. They prefer publisher to publisher, so preferably with a personal contact, uh, that would be done in Frankfurt or London or Bologna for certain publishers, but it's not not necessary. Yeah, they are interested in uh, sort of in Europe more than than U.S., Canada, Latin America, Asia, because uh, we tend to see that as more as more communication that will succeed in Latvia as well, especially if it has global implementation in Scandinavia and other European countries. Uh, and with the association exams, always mention them if they are available, not maybe as the first thing, but they are extremely important because of the small print runs. And even if there's 1,000 or 2,000 euros that they might be able to get as a grant, uh, it's much, much more likely to sell. Uh, this is the general things of uh, how of the typical uh, advances and royalties and right situations here. And if, uh, if you get an offer of something that's very different from what you see here, the one euro per copy printed, or 8% for print books royalty-wise, that can be a warning bell, or if they ask for rights um, for other markets as well, or something like that. There have been a couple of controversial diplomatic cases with rights, um, but they tend to be more one or two publishers that had these issues, and they're really out of the picture by now. And uh, what's also important is that mostly you're speaking to somebody directly responsible for buying and making decisions, so not assistance pretty much. And uh, but the book says the the rights wouldn't be bought and sold there, but getting to know people in says would be a good first step to to get to know them and have them pay attention to what you have to offer. And uh, as I spoke recently to one of the publishers that I'm translating for, a smaller publisher of science fiction fantasy, and among things they were complaining about was that uh, American publisher in this case didn't understand that uh, we're a small country and there was limited print runs so he wasn't very happy that they asked to send, I think, eight or ten copies of a Latvian book to U.S. because it adds quite a lot of, uh, quite large proportion of the expenses to the to the of what cost to produce a book. Uh, about uh, libraries and uh, bookshops, about bookshops, I think I told you more or less the situation. Uh, yeah, the Russian books tend to be carried in Latin bookshops, but not vice versa. And uh, some large bookshops, especially Jan Kruza and the one called Globus, they have a decent English language section, but they order their stuff from UK distributors mostly, or Euro-based Euro distributors. If you're interested in that, uh, I can get in touch with them as well. If you have an title that has a Latin connection, that is not being translated, it's definitely worth uh, contacting them, and they will probably order some 10 copies or whatever. As for libraries, uh, you saw before that a lot of people use libraries, and the system is uh, very, very strong still, but the books they buy can be focused more towards the commercial end of the spectrum, and which is different from other Western European countries that have some uh, more uncommercial titles available. And that just tends to be more romance, crime, things that people actually uh, read in high numbers. Uh, ebooks and audio books I put together because simply physical format of still the thing. And books are seen just as much physical objects and decoration and a status symbol as an entertainment, which I think is probably one of the reasons why they're 
compared to the less people reading because for us books are more of a thing that uh, has carried high status and people are sometimes afraid to read, uh, to read for entertainment or they don't believe that it can be entertaining necessarily it's only something that you do to better yourself. But anyway, uh, with the e-books and uh, audiobooks, the problem is that there's no centralized distribution platform. There's a subscription service that's quite popular that's trying to get uh, readers from in other countries as well, a new startup, and uh, they they tend to do that well, but uh, they don't offer ebooks as such. You can read uh, basically PDFs uh, online if you have constant connection to their server, so it's a bit different. And Zeitung is the only major publisher that has ebooks available for most of the titles. As I live abroad, this is great, but unfortunately. Uh, a lot of other publishers don't bother with the ebooks. They might not even ask you for rights if you if they have to pay extra, because the sales are really quite low. with also dozens of copies of that. And uh, audiobooks, the situation is even worse because well, there's quite high cost involved in producing an audiobook, which if you sell 5,000 copies, not a big deal, but for Latin publishers, it is a big deal. So. Either the, the very best sellers or children's titles. Maybe now, since uh, since younger people tend to listen to audiobooks more, not only, and just be more of a middle aged retired thing, at least from the states I've seen, maybe it will change. But uh, at the moment, this is the situation that we have. Now, uh, finally, to finish it up, I will briefly talk about uh, important lesson communications in math, since, especially since it's, uh, it's my day job, basically. And as far as, as, far as the original lesson literature is concerned, it's these publishers that, uh, that are the main ones. Uh, Vice is doing a lot of different things, but as I mentioned before, and you saw in the chart, it's not necessarily the ones that are more popular and the, um, the more in demand. However, they do have a strong science fiction fantasy section, and also local crime tends to be focused, to be uh, centered in science. Dean's Gramata are the main literary fiction publishers. They have, after some bankruptcies, they have almost all the Latin literary fiction authors, with few sections, which is not too good for market, but uh, it's good for them, and they really do publish some good stuff. Then children's books, uh, Peter Gauss and Milton Moss, along with Zweigner, uh, these are the main ones, uh, poetry and art books. Nepotism is very wonderful, but it's very partition kind of thing. But if you're interested in poetry, nepotism are the people for you at the moment. Or or the beta, they're also doing some great stuff. And yeah, the sample citations are available for practically uh, all the important titles that have come out recently, some backlog and classic uh, titles as well, but less so, still a decent amount, I would say. Uh, what is important is that uh, rights are kept by authors very commonly. Now, more and more, I probably should keep the rights, but it used to be that authors always kept the rights. However, in, uh, in meetings with foreign publishers, in selling rights, they are mostly represented by publishers, their publishers, or state literary agents, yeah. and I'm one of them. So we go share the meet with publishers, we uh, show them the samples, we tell them about the books they might be interested in, and then we help them get in touch with the authors or the rights holders, and then we start to take also the application for the grants, which have been quite generous for the last. Five ten years, and uh, they cover the whole amount of of Latin literature, including prose, poetry, nonfiction, children's, whatever, including the ones writing in Russian as well. So that's my pitch, and um, yeah, these are the resources that you have available. If you need more information, uh, you can see them there. Uh, the Samples that I mentioned, you can also write to me, or this is the platform Latin literature, they will have the samples. The writers in the potato house, 
they offer residencies for foreign authors, uh, no strings attached, and there are quite a few authors that have made use of, of this, including, for instance, David Van, the American author who is uh, who is not doing very well in the system. And uh, yeah, that's that's it for me. It's actually one hour, which I'm very happy with. So yeah, this, this is my email, and uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you very much. Uh, so we'll we'll open the floor now for questions. Um, if you uh, have a question, please type it into the Q and A box down at the right hand part of your screen, rather than the chat box, and uh, and we can submit them for discussion. Um, what would you recommend as a first step for a new exporter into Latvia? Or one good tip, I mean, you mentioned not necessarily to use rights agents, so a publisher should aim to be introduced or um, meet a, a Latvian publisher at a fair. Is that what you'd think? Yes, I think ideally uh, it would be personal meeting in the fair uh, because uh, that way there's less exchange of, of ideas, of opinions, and uh, they get to know you better. Uh, and I hope this presentation has helped you understand whom you should contact if you're interested in buying or selling rights. Um, if you are going to London now in April, uh, where we are one of the guest countries, uh, and uh, there will be a lot of patent publishers there, so you can invite the publisher for a meeting and it will go on from there. If not, uh, you can have a look at their catalogs and uh, just write them directly. The uh, apart from Vizna, most others uh, would have even the info app, whatever. Uh, the address would go directly to publisher or one of the people responsible, rather than uh, an intern or an assistant. So, if you write uh, to, the, to that address, still you would uh, be able to pitch your thing directly to publisher. However, I wouldn't recommend starting with with. Uh, commercially minded pitch right away because, well, the people in Latvia, I think, would tend to be a bit uh, taken aback you know, with, with this very direct approach. And uh, also, you can, again, you can contact me and I can uh, give you a direct email address to most of the publishers uh, the, and suggest uh, what they are looking for. But still, I think, uh, I think from their catalogs, it should be quite clear what they are looking for. Okay, and um, you had mentioned there was a, a strong interest in young adult series. Would, is there a similar um, interest from Latvian publishers in the, in the same for children's in middle grade? Or is it growing? Uh, for sure. I think, I think this is uh, one factor that is growing also the series. And uh, because... Uh, Children, I think, in Latvia or everywhere, tend to be quite gracious readers, and if they like one book they read, they want to read a lot that's similar to what by the same author that is, um, is very similar in a way. So, yeah, publishers are looking for a series, uh, both middle grade and uh, and uh, young adult. Uh, kid lit, uh, kids uh, under the age of eight, maybe less so. But uh, if you have something interesting to offer, this is a thriving uh, factor, so they will definitely be more interested uh, if you have a series to offer than just a single book. And middle grade and young adults, yeah, the, the gates are quite open at the moment, I think. Great. Uh, thank you. So as we've now come to the end of the webinar, uh, I'd like to thank um, if you list for such a comprehensive view of the La uh, Latvian publishing market, he has um, provided his email address there if you have any questions that um, you'd like to send directly to him. I'd also like to thank uh, the Canadian Book Fund, component of the Government of Canada, for the final financial support for this event. As a reminder, please be sure to complete the evaluation form that will appear at the end. Your feedback is important to us and helps us provide content and programming that meets your export needs. 
To stay connected with Leave Like Canada Books, follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, or follow us on LinkedIn. Thank you for listening. Thank you.